Moving on to the cache abstraction, the cache abstraction really um, is a um, it's something we we meant to do for a long, long time. It's one of the most requested uh, features. It's for 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 years. Um, so we we basically had it in the plan for at least five years. Um, we even had an org .spring cache package, but up until 3.0, as you may know, um, that package only really contained two the edge cache factory bins, um, none of which were really particularly exciting. Of course, now in 2010-2011, with the rise of uh, distributed caching, with the rise of cloud environments in particular, um, where the dedicated server, the new control where you would also control local cache setup is kind of becoming less common. Um, Caching needs to be revisited in many ways, and uh, a part, just a small part, of uh, this architectural challenge is Spring's cache abstraction here, where we allow uniform access uh, to any such caching infrastructure from a Spring-based application using Cache Manager and Cache um, API types. The uh, backend adapters, of course, an abstraction is only. With uh, as much as uh, there are better adapters for it, um, the edge cache, of course, where we used to have some factory bins, is uh, an important backend adapter that we ship with Spring Core. So it comes with Spring 3.1 and 1 already. Um, but the, uh, of course, the big benefit of the abstraction is that it does allow for plugging in custom adapters. Some of which we ship in, uh, in sister projects, like the Spring Gemfire project. Some of which uh, will be shipped by third parties, I'm sure. So um, it's really a quite typical Spring style abstraction at that level. There's even uh, a relationship with uh, the environment support that we've been talking about before. Imagine different caching setup, different caching infrastructure being available in different target environments. So in a local environment, you might just not have very sophisticated cache setup because uh, um, you might not care, but in production you might have a, uh, a rich deployment environment, possibly a private cloud environment that comes with several services. One of them would be a caching service, and you would of course want to make the best possible use. So um, if you are using Spring Fluid 1, um, specific target profile for your production environment that happens to use um, a different cache manager, and in the development environment, uh, development environment would be a completely natural thing to do. So let me leave the cache abstraction behind for a moment um, and move up um, to the declared caching part of it. In Spring Fluid 1, we also ship a set of caching annotations. As you can see here, without going into too much detail, um, you would annotate specific service methods or service methods, maybe repository methods of yours. And uh, the declarative caching support would intercept those calls, um, see what I find a matching, a matching return value in the cache. Uh, if not, it would actually execute the method and cache the result afterwards. So this is really about interacting with the cache. And in a declarative way, using add cacheable in particular here, yeah, you could very easily translate this typical um, caching interaction into uh, a declarative world. You could of course also just inject the cache that you'd like to use and programmatically do uh, getting and putting into the cache. Um, at Cacheable is just a declarative, more convenient way of interacting with the cache that our caching support in Spring through that one comes with. There's also support for cache eviction, for cache conditions, um, of course for putting objects into specific cache regions. So this slide only really shows the most basic um, use cases for um, the caching annotations. Configuring a cache is works the way you would expect it to in the spring world. There is a cache annotation driven element in the cache XML namespace. It's typically pointing to a cache manager B, which is where you would choose the specific implementation um, that you'd like to use very similar to TX annotation driven and its uh, transaction manager reference. So 
there are no surprises here. And uh, typical implementations, uh, you would of course reuse the ones that are readily available, like the Edge Cache Cache Manager that we ship, um, or externally provided cache manager adapters from Spring Sister projects or other third parties. Configuring a cache is works the way you would expect it to in the Spring world. There is a cache annotation driven element in the cache XML namespace. It's typically pointing to a cache manager B, which is where you would choose the specific implementation um, that you'd like to use, very similar to TX annotation driven and its uh, transaction manager reference. So no surprises here. And uh, typical implementations, uh, you would of course reuse the ones that are readily available, like the Edge Cache Cache Manager that we ship, um, or externally provided cache manager adapters from Spring Sister projects or other third parties. All right. So much for the functionality or for selected functionality included 1M1, uh, which is about to be released tomorrow. I'd also like to give you a bit of an output on the 3D1 and 2 um, in the remainder in a few minutes. In 3D1 and 2, we have a focus on web applications, on using the Spring at MVC programming model for um, the challenges that next generation web applications um, present to us. Um, there is a bit of general overhaul done in uh, the way that we process at controls and at request mapping classes. I'm assuming you're familiar with the basic model, uh, which of course proved to be pretty successful, very, very popular, um, despite its rather recent introduction in, in Spring 2.5 and its extension in Spring 3.0. We have several things on the wish list, and this is what's being worked on as we speak. Uh, refinements of the mapping strategies for, for specific handle methods where you could do arbitrary combinations of the methods across any number of controllers, uh, a one-phase mapping instead of the present two-phase mapping where you first select the controller, then select the method. Uh, we would allow this to be a bit more flexible by pointing to any target method directly. Um, which you appreciate in, in the mapping details. There's also the notion of intercepting a request on a per method basis, whereas existing Spring functionalities typically intercept a request on a per handler, per controller object basis. Um, and generally speaking, we'd like to make the handler method argument resolution more flexible, in particular for customizing it uh, with uh, in custom argument resolvers for specific custom argument types of yours. This, this is possible in Spring 3.0, the but there are plenty of things we can improve on. This is exactly what we do in 3.1 here. Another topic on our um, R&D list is conversation management. We have a strong web focus, of course, but it's not actually a web-only feature, um, but from the perspective of, uh, of uh, this, this session today. Let's focus on the website, uh, where it's really um, a kind of HTTP session plus plus, a more flexible version of HTTP sessions attribute storage. The idea of such a more flexible conversational store abstraction and the management of a current conversation that goes with a specific request, where any incoming request may be associated with a current conversation. Those two foundational concepts really provide uh, quite a big flexibility for the state management of the server-side part of your web application. So, from a web perspective, we intend uh, we intend to provide this for use with Spring MVC, but also for use with GSF. So there will be some quite natural um, integration with GSF here through our conversation scoping of Beam. And very important part of it, you may of course programmatically access both the current conversation but also the conversation on store at any time, uh, which is a pretty important part of, uh, of the picture here for the more challenging, the more flexible requirements towards state management in the modern web application. So next to this more general um, concept of conversation management, which to some degree also 
translates to the spring integration world, for example. We have a much more web specific uh, idea in mind here as well, which is window specific sessions. Um, it's a, a simple problem where um, you, you're basically happy with uh, Spring MVC's storage of form session attributes. But you would like a bit of isolation between browser windows, browser tabs, uh, several tabs in the same browser, um, which is not quite trivial to solve at the moment. It's of course possible, but you would have to do it in a custom fashion. Um, the problem originates um, with HTTP sessions being identified by a shared cookie. And of course, um, all the tabs of your browser share the same, the same cookie, so they all really participate in the same HTTP session. And with window sessions, you would have a quite natural way of having an isolated local set of attributes for the specific window or specific tab um, that your application is currently operating in. The window in this case would be managed by framework um, facilities, by um, specific fields in particular, um, which just identifies and carries along a window identifier um, with all the interaction that your application does. So any link, any form submission would have to carry along a window identifier um, that the framework then manages and uses for identifying the specific attributes that have been stored for this specific window. Um, there is a, a quite extensive prototype for this already available, um, but we'll only really uh, revisit this for 3.1 and 2, and we'll publish um, the base functionality for this with the, the upcoming 3.1 and 2 release in April. This is a bit of a simple problem, so it may have a simple solution, um, as opposed to the more general idea of conversation management. For the last couple of uh, items here, Server so 3.0 is, a, as I already mentioned, an important part of Java E6. Um, Pumpkin 7 recently um, provided its first release that was marked as production ready. So it's really about catching up with uh, the specific server through the low features from a framework side, where if you deploy the Pumpkin 7 or any other server through the low container, um, you could just make the best possible use of the server through the low features that the container na natively has. And there are, there's one specific interesting area, um, which is uh, the server through the low functionality for bootstrapping a web application without the use of WebXML. Uh, there is a certain the container initializer feature in Server 3.0, uh, which is really a nice um, hook for bootstrapping a Spring application contest, uh, quite similar to what uh, container um, content for the listener does um, in, in a typical Spring web app setup. And in this case, in combination with uh, Spring's configuration class model, with the environment abstraction, with all the support that comes with it, um, this will provide a very nice overall experience for setting up a server-based web application with a Spring application context or several Spring application context inside. And so the three though really provides us just with a foundation where we can finally go into areas that we couldn't before, where WebXML was simply uh, unavoidable. Now it is an option and it will have alternatives that we are exploring here. And of course, there's other native server to develop functionality, which I can't go into much detail on here, um, like the support for asynchronous request processing, um, switching a current request, current service request into um, an async mode. Um, none of this is prevented by Spring anyway, um, so because Spring quite natively exposes certain functionality if you wanted to. But there might be just a couple of things that we can do to make the overall experience as smooth as possible. Um, um, and as a, final, uh, as a final note, there's also standardized file upload support now in Server 3.0 that we are trying to use behind our multipod resolver abstraction um, instead of using common file upload which is the typical choice today.